Humans cross the Bering Land Bridge, Clovis points in hand, they show up on the North American continent, and in just a few generations, they have wiped out all of the megafauna. Every single animal over 100 pounds is gone. This concept is known as the overkill hypothesis, more specifically the Pleistocene overkill hypothesis, and it's not exactly accepted by all academics. And the way the data has been presented over the years, well, this has lent itself to a situation that was so weirdly unscientific that I couldn't believe it. My jaw was hanging open for, for the first day or two. So anyway, sit yourself down and let me share some of my bafflement with you. Hi, my name is Dan, and welcome to the Dunking. The overkill hypothesis originated in the 1960s from the work of geoscientist and paleobiologist Paul Martin. He was not the first to believe humans wiped out many extinct animals. This idea was prevalent in the 19th century when the first acceptance of humans coexisting with animals like the woolly rhinoceros became common in scientific circles. The idea was so prevalent that it was referred to as the favorite hypothesis in 1872's edition of Geological Magazine. But the idea fell somewhat out of favor as gradualism replaced catastrophism, and that basically left a corpse for Paul Martin to breathe life back into. And breathe life into it he did, the 1960s hippie movement and newfound ecological concerns being in the public's eye made fertile ground for the idea humans destroy environments anywhere and everywhere we go. Making the overkill hypothesis not only attractive as an answer to the scientists, but also the interested amateur, the armchair historian, the social zeitgeist and timing of the hypothesis allowed it to really take off in the public's mind and gain a lot of popularity, but there were a lot of cracks in it and they were apparent immediately. The lack of sites with humans and megafauna interacting was the first thing to be mentioned by critics. There are now as many as 26 and as few as 17 sites, depending on who is asked. And in these sites, of the 37 different genera of animals that went extinct, only five are found, with some archaeologists claiming only two of these genera show signs of humans hunting them, leaving either 32 or 35 species of large animal to have been wiped out by humans with no evidence for this at all. Martin has responded to this by claiming the speed of the destruction was quick because humans are super predators. Why this results in a lack of sites is not explained, and many an archaeologist has complained that this is a poor standard for evidence. It's the absence of evidence. And let's be clear, when archaeologists are telling you that your standard of evidence is shit, it might be time for you to reevaluate your standard of evidence. In addition to this, Overkill uses assumptions that stem from island species. For instance, the naivete of creatures with little predation causes them to be more likely to be hunted to extinction, like the dodo bird. But island species are notoriously different. Creatures become larger or smaller, birds nest on the ground more often, and predation for many creatures is all but non-existent. This hypothesis was built on a lot of assumptions, and some of these really don't hold up to any scrutiny. Now there is another hypothesis that challenges Overkill. And that hypothesis would be climate change caused the extinctions. We know that the climate changed drastically and that the North American continent was particularly hit hard. This offers another explanation that gets more support than the overkill hypothesis from the data. And with all this taken into account, we have a situation where the majority of archaeologists do not accept the overkill hypothesis as the main reason for the extinction of the megafauna in North America. In 2012, at the annual Society for American Archaeology meeting, out of the 91 archaeologists that were asked, the main cause of megafaunal extinctions in North America is dot dot dot, 82% said a combination of factors, 18% said climate change, and exactly 0% said human hunting. When asked to list the importance of factors, hunting does come in second to climate change, but a distant second. Basically, this is not an accepted hypothesis in archaeology. Human hunting did cause a lot of damage, especially when you consider things like changes made to the landscape in order to facilitate more successful hunting expeditions. I mean, just imagine a band of humans stacking rocks and digging trenches to corral game and force them in one direction. And then a couple generations later, the humans relocate or they get killed off, but other predators move in and start using those man-made features to disproportionately wipe out their food source. And if the humans were like corralling the animals towards a cliff and run them off the side, you know, lightning could strike a hundred years later and animals run that direction again and kill some. It's, it's not unthinkable that humans had a major impact on the megafauna on the North American continent when they showed up. But to put them over the environment, especially when we know the climate changed drastically at that time? Ridiculous, and many scientists agree. In 2005, a genetic study suggested as few as 70 people populated the North American continent in the first wave. 
Other studies claim as many as a few thousand, but the number is still small for a species killing blitz across a continent that happens so quick that signs are hard to find. In addition to this, sites like the Page Ladson site in Florida show that humans coexisted with megafauna, in this case mastodons, camelids, and bison, for thousands of years, hunting them but not wiping them out. Evidence shows the ice-free corridor and the Bering Land Bridge wouldn't have been able to sustain life so that humans couldn't have used it to migrate for at least 900 years after it was opened. And this is several thousand years after we already know humans were in North America. And this means there's no real reason to accept the overkill hypothesis. It just kind of slipped through the cracks. And the way that it's still used today in the scientific community is insane. For instance, those of us into Atlantis and ancient mysteries can expect to see overkill used as a cudgel to knock our favorite hypothesis right off of the board. Oh, no, 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 no. As particularly we see it used against the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis with the claim being made that the hypothesis can't be right because man, not climate change, killed those animals. We also hear that overkill proves humans came to the Americas relatively late in our history. Otherwise, the creatures would have been less susceptible to hunting due to a much longer contact between our species. And many of us alternate researchers have looked into the Clovis weapons of mass destruction and we find the ideal wanting, as many archaeologists do. But other fields of study still use it, and much like the debunkers who use overkill to undermine claims of floods or comets, these other fields are using it for ideological reasons. In particular, we see this in papers, scientific, peer-reviewed papers that are using the overkill hypothesis to push a narrative. Usually they seek to find a connection between human activity and extinctions or other ecological disasters. And those papers are five times more likely than archaeology papers to present the overkill hypothesis as factual and indicative of human destructive tendencies or other ideological positions. Over 60% of the archaeology papers that cite the overkill hypothesis are debating the cause of extinctions, while just over 20% of the ecology papers are debating the cause and 32% of the ecology papers saying humans did it. I mean, clearly this is problematic. I mean, the overkill hypothesis isn't accepted in archaeological circles, but it's still being cited regularly in other areas of science. Why is this? Well, in a 2018 paper titled The Overkill Model and Its Impact on Environmental Research, the authors have this to say. Unfortunately, the underlying idea behind this process is not just that human colonization causes extinction, but that humans as a species are inherently destructive. In the conservation and neo-ecology literature, this idea has been used two ways. First is to use the relationship to set up the argument that humans have been detrimental to the environment, thus ecological reparations are required. This thinking has led to proposals such as Pleistocene rewilding and de-extinction. Some proponents of both proposals use overkill to argue that North American fauna is depauperate because humans caused the mass extinctions at the end of the Pleistocene. Thus, it is argued that it is our moral and ethical responsibility to repopulate the landscape with descendants, close relatives, or clones of that megafauna. We note that many ecologists have been critical of the overkill model and particularly of Pleistocene rewilding. However, the overall trend in the citation analysis and literature we reviewed is that overkill is more likely to be treated as the explanation for the extinctions such that support for overkill can be found even in the argument of some critics of rewilding. So in a nutshell, the archaeologists that pen this paper feel that overkill is being used in a way that is less than scientific. And this isn't because they haven't been trying to get these guys to stop. They actually say that they've been trying, but... Currently, the peer-reviewed ecological literature in which archaeologists assert that there are issues with the overkill hypothesis is limited. But this is not from a lack of effort. In our experience, claims made by archaeologists about the data and underlying assumptions of overkill are downplayed by some ecologists. We find it curious that some researchers appear reticent to accept arguments and data from archaeologists, particularly given that our field of expertise is studying the interaction and impact of human actions on species and ecosystems across time and space. Summary studies by paleo or neoecologists are not equivalent to archaeological studies that assess the quality of evidence for association between megafauna and humans during the terminal Pleistocene. As archaeologists, we take for granted that archaeological data are necessary for evaluating the role that humans may have played in the extinction of the megafauna. The presence of megafaunal remains in archaeological sites is required to demonstrate that people interacted with megafauna, not just that they coexisted on the continent at the same time. So the archaeologists argue with the ecologists, the ecologists have no evidence, and the archaeologists say these guys are just arguing this from an idealistic perspective. 
It's like putting the shoe on the other foot for a change, huh? And it is a serious problem, considering that ecology is a field of study. The interdisciplinary communication, and indeed debates, need to be more common. And more public as it is, one could be forgiven for thinking archaeologists have given up on correcting their equivalents in other fields at all. Instead, they seem to focus solely on debunking Atlantis, ancient aliens, and other claims they label pseudo-archaeology. They make it their goal online, teach classes to upperclassmen on tactics to use against people like Graham Hancock or Randall Carlson, and they conflate a belief of a lost civilization with believing in a flat earth. They make it very clear and very public. They treat this as a war. Meanwhile, other quote-unquote scientists are misusing the data that the archaeological field provides with the clear goal that is not necessarily beneficial to anyone and is not based on evidence, but most of the archaeologists don't seem to care. Which is very worrying to me because it seems clear that most people realize when Graham or Randall say mainstream science doesn't agree with my position here, that what they're saying is look into this for yourself, don't just take my word as the authority here, the quote-unquote experts disagree with me. But a scientist publishing a paper in a peer-reviewed journal does not invite such scrutiny. So it seems to me the archaeologists are avoiding dealing with the real problem, and instead they attack things that insult them personally. Ecologists using data that flies in the face of what archaeologists believe and discussing archaeology is apparently far less offensive to them than some guy on Netflix saying that he doesn't like archaeologists. Maybe it's because the ecologists are quote-unquote on team science like they are. It's hard to say for sure. Maybe it just comes down to the use of overkill to debunk the comet impact hypothesis and other atlantis -y ideas. They just kind of leave it there because it's helpful to them. As it is, I can't really help but wonder why we matter more than the scientists standing next to these guys. But I think ego once again is the issue. Scientists who struggle in their pride will always be neglectful or just plain wrong. And here we have the neglect of archaeology of allowing ecology to be just plain wrong. I mean, there's no two ways about it. The overkill hypothesis does not have enough evidence for it to have permeated the scientific community like it has. But here it is. It's broken science. And, you know, I know a lot of people like to say that I'm not a scientist because I was an electrician, but um, I like to point out frequently, those of you who've watched me live have certainly heard me mention this before, Archaeology is not a real science um, in the regard that the universe doesn't test it. The universe tests an electrical circuit that I designed and it tells me if I'm right or wrong. It's science. Um, if two archaeologists believe in Harry Potter, they could just circle jerk back and forth and peer review papers based on them ideologically believing in exactly like what we have happening in this whole mess that I'm talking about here. It's more than just archaeology. It's all of the sciences that are not really evidence-based that allow for ideology to really prop up the narrative. And having said all of that, I want to thank you very much for watching and remind you once again, December 5th through 7th, I will be in Scottsdale, Arizona for the Quest for the Past conference. It's going to be awesome. I hope to see you there. Link to purchase tickets is down below. See you next time.